So we've seen some of the things that Gibbon can do. If you are new to Gibbon, then this next section is going to be about downloading and installing the system. So if we go back to the Gibbon homepage at gibbonedu.org and go to download, you can get a quick sense of the system um, using the Softaculous demo. If you are using a shared host that supports cPanel, which is a control panel for hosting, and they have Softaculous enabled, you can do a very quick installation using Softaculous. It's basically a, a one-click, they call it a one-click install, but I guess there's, there's a couple more clicks involved. Uh, but it, it's pretty easy. If you've got your own server, or you want to control your installation more, then you can download Gibbon. Um, that download comes as a zip file here on my desktop. So I'm going to extract that zip file. Take a moment. And we'll see here core 13 is the folder that it produced. Um, we can do this on a whole range of servers. In this case, I'm going to be using um, the MAMP application stack, our uh, server stack that comes as an application and runs on Mac and Windows. Um, you could do this on Linux, you could do this on Windows, it doesn't really matter. The principle is the same, which is that somewhere on your server, once you get your server set up, and we'll be covering that in session four, starting at one o'clock later on, if you're interested in learning more about server setups, in HT Docs, which is your uh, document root, it has different names in different systems. Um, this is the the uh, the area of your server, this folder that corresponds to the root of your domain or subdomain. So anything that we put in here will be visible on our server. In this case, I can browse to my server as local host. Um, that's just because it's a local testing environment. Usually you'd have an IP address or domain name to do this. So we can see this folder here in my document root, and we can see that folder here uh, in my browser. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag my newly downloaded 13.0.01, uh, and I'm going to drop it in here. And when I refresh, I'll see it there. I don't really like this kind of, uh, of, of name for a system. So I just want my users to see it as Gibbon, so that I have a folder called Gibbon. When I click on that, it's going to recognize that this is a fresh set of Gibbon files, and it's going to take me directly to the installer. Does anyone have any questions about that bit so far? Wait a moment. I'm happy to stop talking for a minute to see what happens. I feel in my element here as a teacher because I've got a captive audience and I'm just going to talk all day. Keep the questions coming if you have any. Um, so now we see the installer here. Uh, version 13 features Sandra's lovely uh, setup check. And we've got a lot of green ticks down here, which means that we're okay to go. Um, you can see the active languages that are available. Um, I'm just going to do it in UK English. So I'm going to press submit to move on to the step two, which is entering the database information. Um, so I don't want to go into databases too much, uh, but in systems like Gibbon and other similar systems such as, uh, let's say, WordPress, you have a, a range of files um, that are rendered by the web server that give you the interface, but the information that goes into the interface is drawn from a database behind the scenes. Um, MySQL is the most popular open source database, uh, so Gibbon uses that as the only option. Um, Erco at uh, the Bali Island School says that you can do it with MariaDB, which is a fork of MySQL. One day, when we're fully object-oriented, we may offer a choice of databases, so you could use uh, Post, Post, Postgre, or what have you. Yeah, yeah. SQLite. SQLite, yeah, and a, a range of other things. But MySQL is a pretty good option for most schools. Um, in most cases, your database is going to be on the same server 
as your web server. If you've got a really big install, you might separate them into two, but in most cases, you can just say local host, right? The database server is uh, the computer that, that the web server is on. Uh, you can set up a database yourself in advance, but if you don't set one up, then you can just type in the name of your chosen database, and as long as it doesn't um, already exist and, and is full of conflicting stuff, it should still work. Um, I'm just going to call this one given training. I'm going to pop in there. Uh-oh, my password's going to be unmasked here for a second. It's a local host. You should be it's a local host. I don't think if I've ever used this password somewhere else before. Oh, it's not local just one. Local host one? No, I've changed it. I'm just going to slide that one out of sight there and type this in and then press enter. Put your hand over, you won't be able to see it. Oh, that was working. <laughs> oh no, it's masked. Phew. We did a good job there on masking it. Sorry, for a moment there I thought it wasn't masked. Unfortunately, I pressed enter twice, um, and so I've ruined my own demo installation, which is a good start. That's okay, there's a way to fix this. Um, I'm going to go back to my data. It's a good teachable moment here. I'm going to delete the config file in the given installation. It's now going to assume that it's never been installed before. And I'm just going to go back to the start of the process. All right. Let's try that again. <laughs> You'd think I'd know that password was masked, given that I've done this a lot of times. Um, there we go. Uh, with the demo data field, um, it takes longer to install if you include the demo data, and it's not very good for production use, but if you're just experimenting with the system, what the demo data gives you is a full pretend school, actually based on my own school with the data mast, um, that lets you see how things work without having to build everything yourself. Um, in this case, because we're going to go into uh, setting up a school next, I'm going to say demo data is off. So when I press submit, it's going to create the database, populate it with the given uh, database. There we go. And it's going to ask me to set up my first user account and then give my school a name um, and just do the very basic settings. So in here, uh, I'm not going to select a title because I don't like being Mr. Parker. I might rather be Ross. In here, I'm going to set this up. Um, if you leave this box checked, you will join our mailing list and get a welcome email. Um, I'm going to unselect that, but it's useful if it's your first installation to do that. I'm going to call my first user admin. This is going to be an administrative user, but you can give it any name. I'm just going to choose a password for myself. It's going to set where to uh, where where our given installation is on our server in two different ways. Um, you can change that. If it doesn't look right to you, but it should, it should work right. Um, the install type here is as much for you to just keep a track on what this given installation is. Um, it doesn't change the fun functionality in any particular way. But if you leave statistics collection on, it does tell us what kind of installation you, you're, you're running. Um, and, and that just helps us understand how given is used. Um, if you're using a stable download of Gibbon, that is the one that is listed here, cutting edge code will automatically be set to no and you can't change it. If you download the development version from GitHub, which we can find here, you go to github.com and search for Gibbon edu. Any idea why I've done that? The organization's given you the PDU and the repository is core. core uh, There's yes. going to be a whole bunch of those. Yeah, there is. How do you find users? There we go. That's what we want. Right. Here's our organizational account. Here are the different repositories that we run. And I'm going to go into the core repository. The master branch is the last stable release. So if I switch over to um, one of the other branches, which generally they'll only be the next release. I could download this by downloading the zip and use that instead. I wouldn't want to do that in production, but if I want to get involved in development um, or if I want to test some of the latest features so that I can uh, feedback to the team, 
that's where you're going to get that. If you do that, what you're going to see in the installer is the cutting edge code goes to yes. And that affects the way that you get updates. If you start with stable code, you don't want to switch it sometime in the future to cutting edge code unless you really know what you're doing and vice versa. Um, so my recommendation would be um, for production definitely to use stable. For learning about the system, use stable. But for development and testing um, and seeing what's coming up, go with the cutting edge code. Statistics collection uh, tells us the name of your school, um, your current installation URL, and your installation type, as it says down here. Um, we don't use that for marketing. We just keep an eye on who's installing it so that we can get a sense of the given community and know who might reach out for us. Um, up until today, there's been about 5,500 known installations through the statistics collection, and that's really useful for us to see the spread of Gibbon. Um, up until version 7, there were no installations of Gibbon that I didn't know about, which was really sad because it was just me and I think Andy using the system. Uh, so it's definitely growing from that early start. Um, I'm going to call my school testing school. I'm going to give it the initials TS. Um, okay, sorry, Google Calendar alert there. Uh, let me just check on time. Okay. Um, it defaults to Australian dollars. Um, I'm going to change it to Hong Kong dollars because that's where we are. If you want to, you can email uh, support at givenedu.org to get a value added license. Uh, at the moment, this just gives you uh, a load of SQL queries for, um, for the query builder unit, it lets you access your data in a more flexible way. Um, the, the keys are free. Uh, for now, we might charge one day in the future, uh, but at the moment, they're free. So if you've applied for one of those, you can install it here, but you can always come back and do that later on. Um, I'm going to say down here for country that we're in Hong Kong, and the time zone is set to Hong Kong by default because that's where I live, but you can also go to time zone here and choose from any time zone. One day we're going to build a drop down menu of time zones there. All right, so I press submit. It's finished the installation, and it said you can now go to your home page in order to log in. So here we go. Um, I can see now my school initials that I selected up here. I can see that student applications and staff applications are turned on by default, and I can log in with that username and password. All right, so what I have now is a blank installation of Gibbon, um, and this is where a lot of people start asking questions and looking on the forum, what's the best way to proceed in setting up a school and getting started? Um, if you go to the support section on our website and you go to administrators, um, and I have to apologize, our documentation is not what it should be, uh, it's a work in progress, but we're always looking for volunteers to help us uh, if there's anyone out there who wants to write some documentation. All right. In a moment, that's going to load, and you'll actually be able to find a link um, that was available before I clicked away from the installer. That final link said that there was a user guide available. There we go. Okay. Um, that user guide is getting started with Gibbon. So if you want to, to understand the way that Gibbon approaches structuring a school, this is really the place to start. The Gibbon website is on some relatively inexpensive hosting with a company called Green Geeks. It's generally exceptionally uh, reliable and the speed tends to be okay internationally even though it's US based. Uh, but today, of course, because we're live, it's going to just be really slow. So let's just wait a second for that to load up. Andy, can you just try and load that for me just so I can look over each other? Getting started with Gibbon, number three. Bam, 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 bam. Yeah. All right. It seems to like Andy more than it likes me. I'm just going to peer at his computer over here. All right. Um, so I'd really like to bring this up on screen so that you can see it, but at the moment you can't. Um, if you go, oh, Andy's using Australian scrolling upside down. I have to push <laughs> the other way on this trackpad. It means to going the right way. Going the right way, the old-fashioned way. Okay, we've got it on my screen so I can go back to natural scrolling. 
Uh, I think it was Google that coined that term <laughs> for backward scrolling. Well, Scrap that idea. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's scroll. Actually, Andy, Andy is a New Zealander in some weird sense. So there you go. We can call That's it New Zealand yeah. scrolling. Yes. That makes sense. All right. Um, there's a video here that walks you through the process of getting started. Um, where you'd really want to start is looking at your system settings. Um, so if we go in to admin and system settings, you'll see some of the things that we just set up in the installer, but you'll see a range of other settings as well. Um, so you could look through that and start customizing the fundamental parameters about your system, like how long people stay logged in, what kind of HTML you want people to post, um, localization, various links, Google Analytics, things like that. Um, once you've worked through those settings and got things to your liking, the next thing to look at is the school structure. And I would start with your years, days, and times, which just constrains your calendar and how things work. Um, so let's have a look at that now. That's under school admin. So you go admin, school admin. And by default, it brings you into the manage school years section. So given divides time into a set of sequential school years, um, there's been some questions recently from people uh, running tutorial centers who don't want school years, they just want an infinite uh, length of time. The best solution we have for that at the moment is just to create a multi-year, like a 10-year school year, um, and just keep everything within a single year. Uh, but for most schools, you have discrete academic years. So you can see here, uh, we've got 2013, 14, 14, 15, so on, to 16, 17. Um, years have three statuses, past, current, or upcoming. So at this point, if this was my system, I'd want to create an upcoming year so that I can make use of features that let me set things up for next year. So let's do that now. I'm going to add a school year. It's going to be 2017-18. It's upcoming. The sequence number should be 9. Right? It has to be unique, and it orders the years just in case you mess up your dates. Okay. Uh, we're going to say that this school year is going to start on the 30th of August 2017, and it's going to run to the 30th of June, 2018. All right, and there we have it, our new school year set to upcoming. Uh, there's a rollover feature in Gibbon, so at some point in the future, at the end of this year, I can push everyone into the following year and turn the following year into the current year. Um, we don't need to think about that for now, but that's one of the reasons why you might want to set this up. And you can set as many upcoming years as you like. The application form, uh, for students, they need to select the year that they're applying to. So for us, we always try and have five or six years in advance, just in case people want to apply for an advance. Of course, if you don't want people doing that, you add fewer years uh, to this view. Within the school years, we see terms um, and special days, which are your uh, your in-term holidays, and then days of the week. So we're just going to work through these one at a time. So if I go into manage terms, and this is following along uh, pretty much here, what's in the guide that we saw earlier. If I go into manage terms, I see that uh, in the school year 15-16, we had three terms, and in 16-17, um, we also have three terms. Those term dates don't overlap. You could try and make them overlap just to see what happens, but I probably wouldn't recommend that. I don't know if Sandra might make things explode. Not too Hopefully. bad. No? You tried it? Yeah, and then switch back. Okay. There we go. It's always nice to explore these things. Uh, so Christopher asks, when you roll over a student's years automatically incremented by one? Um, yes. So Christopher... Um, student year groups are managed in this grouping section, which we'll come to in a little bit as part of the startup guide. But if I go into that, you'll see that I have these year groups and they have a sequence number that tells me the order that they occur in. Um, when you do the rollover, by default, it's going to move people into the next year group. But the rollover is a massive, long page um, where you get 
to try it. Oh, yeah, you should read and follow these warnings. I clicked through very quickly, but you are really very strongly advised to back up all your data before you proceed. The same when you do a system update. Um, when we look at the rollover, ah, there are no records to show, sorry. What we would see here is a list of students um, fitting into these different categories and staff, and we would see a drop-down menu for their year group and their form group or role group. And those would be set in advance based on what the system knows, but you can change it if you have a student who's repeating or a student who's changing form group or something like that. So you set those students up before you proceed with the rollover. Okay, Christopher, hopefully that helps. If you want to extend that question, just drop that in on the side. Uh, so, Amika, can we import holidays into the system? Um, you can't import them as in from... Ah, you, I know Sandra's smiling now. If you use Sandra's wonderful data admin module, um, which is not in today's thing, but maybe you can, maybe you can mention that in the module section. Um, so, one of the things I mentioned earlier is that you can extend Gibbon by downloading modules. Thank you very much, Sterling. Um, is the site still slow? If you go to the extend section, you'll see a range of modules that you can install so that if the Gibbon core doesn't do what you want, you can make it do new things. We'll look at building modules later on, but for now, just remember that there are uh, about a dozen extra modules um, that can change the way that your system works. So one of those is Sandra's data admin, which can let you import the holidays, but I'm just going to show you how to do it manually in a minute with special days. Uh, once we've got our terms set up here, when we go to special days, we'll see all of the days of the week and our terms and all of the school days within those terms. By default, Gibbon runs uh, I guess, when I say Judeo-Christian style calendar, I think that makes sense, uh, with the week running from Monday to Friday. Um, you can adjust that under days of the week. So you'll see every day of the week here, and these will be translated into other languages if you translate. You can turn days on or off um, as you like. So if we were to turn on Saturday, I'm going to introduce Saturday schooling, in my school German style, and I go to uh, special days, I will see that Saturday now has school days available. So in some places I've been asked that they can turn Mondays off, um, things like that, that is doable through days of the week. When you look in days of the week, um, you'll see that there are four different times. Uh, this confuses a few people, so just to clarify, um, school opens is when your gates open and people are allowed to enter the school. School starts is when um, teachable lessons start in the day or when your, your form tutors meet their students. School ends is when lessons end and school closes is when the gates shut and everyone is kicked out. Um, school opens and closes I don't think is actually used very much anywhere in the system. Uh, but school starts and ends is used in the timetable quite a lot. So if we want to add a public holiday um, not using Sandra's data admin tool, which um, Amika, yes, is one of the extensions, if we just want to add it by hand, um, let's say we, we feel sorry for our students, say to start on the Monday and we're going to give them the Tuesday off just to recover, I can click on that day and I can say we're going to close school on that day uh, for a student rest day. All right, I'm going to save that, and the student rest day appears here. That's now going to be blocked out in the timetable when we get the timetable set up. Uh, the other option then, instead of closing school, is just to adjust the timing of the school day, in which case, if I amend any of these options from the defaults, like if I say that school uh, ends early, the timetable will be trimmed down on that day so students and parents can see that school is closing. <coughs> Those are our two types. So that's where we would add uh, any early closures, public holidays, uh, teacher training days, and also midterm breaks, school camps, anywhere where the school is effectively shut to students.
Um, one impact here is that attendance can't be taken on a day when school is closed. Okay. Uh, so coming back to our guide here, once we've sorted out the, the fundamental structures of years, days, and times, we can start thinking about our groupings. Uh, we've already seen year groups, which is how we're going to organize our students into cohorts. By default, because Gibbon came out of a secondary school based on the UK system, the system ships with year 7 to 13 as a default. So let's take a look at that under grouping, uh, manage year groups. There they are. You could delete all of those and start again. Um, you could remove year 13 if your school goes up to year 12 and so on. Just make sure that the sequence number um, makes sense in that it's in incremental order. Once you've established your year groups, you can start to decide on role groups. Now, role groups have many different names in different places. Um, in the English system, we call them tutor groups. In some places, they're called homerooms or form groups. Um, in Gibbon, role groups is used in American English, and form groups is used in UK English. But in the forums, we tend to use them interchangeably because there's people from so many places. These are the groupings where there's one teacher responsible for the well-being and pastoral care and attendance of that student. Um, the students in a role group may be in a single year group or they may be vertical, they may span multiple year groups. Um, in our system by default we have no form groups. So I'm going to add a form group. Uh, I'm going to imagine a school where all the year sevens are together and there are three groups of year sevens. So we're going to have year 7.1, so I'm just going to call 7.1. Um, if we had some staff set up, we could assign a tutor to that group, but I'm not going to do that right now. Year 7.2. So here are my three form groups that I've created. When I enroll students in the school, I will put them in a year group and then I will put them also in a role group. And they have to have both of those things to be in a role. Just looking at timing, we've got 15 minutes left for this session. Um, at the end of the session, I'm going to end this call and start a new call. And Sandra and Ray are going to take over. And I'm going to have a bit of a rest. Um, so that will happen in, in 15 minutes time. But we'll just keep going through setting up a school for now. Um, where students are um, organized into or grouped into role groups, teachers and non-teaching staff are generally ma uh, organized into departments. So setting up your departments at this point makes a lot of sense. We can do that here on the managed departments. Uh, some schools use a house system as well to group students vertically into groups uh, in some kind of primitive tribal fashion to fight for points and teachers' favors. Uh, you can do that under house, managed houses. All right, for departments, when we set up a department, they can be learning areas, which are your teaching departments or administrative departments, uh, which would be perhaps your finance office or your admissions office. Um, you can put people into departments, you can create departmental information, and you can make an index of departments that people can see under the learn department. One of the nice things that you can do here, instead of publishing all your curriculum content on a website that has to be constantly updated by hand, if you're running your curriculum through Gibbon, and that's all tied through departments, parents can browse, and actually members of the public, if you enable it, can browse through departmental reading um, and staffing and curriculum information in there, and it's mostly automatically updated from the system. And again, that's one of the advantages of having all your systems in one is that the data can be leveraged from multiple areas to allow you to do more things. As a business person, I'd probably say you can get some synergies from that. Um, other parts of your school structure that you might want to set up at this space are your spaces. Actually, we've changed the name uh, now to facilities rather than spaces. Um, so that would be under other managed facilities. 
Something weird happened there. Oh, okay, I know what happened. Uh, my session expired in a different tab. The default session for security is, uh, for security purposes, about an hour, I think, or maybe even less, half an hour. Anyway, I had uh, something uh, there earlier, and it's, it's kicked me out, so it's not very good. Okay, so logging back in into facilities. Here I can create um, rooms, so my teaching room is C108. I might create that first, then create everyone else's teaching rooms. Um, and I can say how many students can fit in that room, what facilities there are, phone numbers, and things like that. By feeding this, in, this information to your system at the beginning of the process, when you come to do your timetable, you're then able to assign uh, particular classes to particular rooms. That's one of the reasons I'd recommend for doing this earlier on in the process. Okay. Once you've got this information and given those quite a lot about the way your school is set up and run, um, and you're ready then to move on to managing users. Does anyone have any questions about school structure before I move on? All right. Uh, so as I mentioned uh, earlier on, the way Gibbon works is that every person, no matter how many roles they have in the system, have a single user account. And that those user accounts can be um, linked to multiple roles. So the first thing you want to think about is who are the different roles in your school. If we go into user admin now, we can pop over to roles and see the default, the five default roles that the system comes with. So we've got an admin role, parent, student, support staff, and teacher. That's usually enough for most schools to get to get started with, but sooner or later someone's going to say, well, I'm support staff, but I need to do this thing that other support staff can't do. In which case, you might want to create a new role or duplicate an existing role. So I might take this one and call it support staff plus. Um, you might notice that in a lot of places, given us for a name and a short name, sometimes it seems a bit inconvenient, but uh, there's often places where it's important to be able to present information in a small area on the screen, so the short name comes in handy there. Um, sorry if that seems like overkill sometimes, but uh, it, it helps in the long run. So now we have support staff plus down here as our new role. We can see what that can do under permissions. Here are our core roles. Here's our new role. We'll see support staff and support staff plus match. But I can now start turning things on or off specifically for that role. And you'll see out of the box, Gibbon comes with uh, a couple hundred different actions that you can perform. And that can be overwhelming for some people um, to start with. The defaults are really designed to be sensible and intuitive um, and non-risky for most schools. So you can trust that we haven't let your students administer other users' information, for example. Um, but it's worth taking time to get to know the different roles, uh, the, different, the different actions, um, and working out who should go do what. If you want to learn more, you can hover over here and get a description of that role. There's quite a lot of places in Gibbon where if you hover, um, you get a little surprise like that. Um, if you ever read the comic XKCD, it's a bit like that. You get that little extra treat. That's something we may want to make more intuitive in a future version, but you can always try your luck. Now you know the secret, hover over things and see what happens. So that covers then roles and permissions. Once you, once you get that sorted and you're happy with the different groupings of people and what they can do, you can start adding actual users to your system. Um, so I'm going to go back now. Oh, one of the things that you might have noticed is that when we were looking at roles, we had the sidebar down here. This is the standard page layout in Gibbon. Some pages flick over to full screen, um, in which case our module menu becomes collapsed up at the top here. All right? So if you were wondering where that module menu went, there it is. Having got my roles and permissions sorted, I'm now going to look at users. Um, you might want to look at user settings first and custom fields. Um, these let you change the way that you, your, your user information is stored, but probably you just want to get in and start creating people. Um, there is 
with the ability to import users here and families and student enrollment. Again, um, Sandra's data admin uh, module probably makes this a lot easier than the built-in imports. So I'm going to add a new user here. I have many children called test and test one, all these different systems that I set up. But here we go. Um, so I'm going to imagine um, that actually this is my, my sister who works in the school with me. We're going to make this person a member of staff. Um, I'm going to give them the primary role teacher. The system doesn't try and guess at a username, um, although it does from the application system. Um, so if you're automating your workflow for students and staff, you can set um, different standards for creating usernames. So I'm just going to call this person T. Parker, set their password. Uh, we never delete users from Gibbon. I mean, you can, but it's not recommended. Uh, we just set people to left. Sometimes we want to create an account um, and uh, set someone to expected so they don't have access yet, but on a particular start date, they will have access to the system. Um, if you want to automate that so you don't manually need uh, to manage that, if you look in your given files, sorry. if you look in your given files, you'll see a folder called CLI, which has your command line interface scripts. Uh, there's a user admin status check and fix. If you set that up with something called cron, uh, and there are some user guides, there is a user guide on this if this loads up. You can use cron to run that script nightly. Come on, line two, there it is. You can use cron, and the instructions are down here for using cron to run any of those scripts uh, daily, weekly, monthly, however you want. If you do the user management one, it will find users who are expected check their start date and set them to full, and it will set users who are full and have a start date to left. So you can automate some of the comings and goings of your school through that. Okay, I'm gonna make this person full so they can log in right now, um, and that they are live, visible in the system. I can have someone who's live and visible in the system, but I can lock them out from logging in. Um, so for example, um, if we have a case where there is a parent and we need to maintain information about that parent, but we don't want them to log into the system and view information about their kids for whatever reason, um, we can set them to not log in. And for security reasons, uh, new users will be forced to reset password on their first login, but you can set that to not if you want. There's a range of other useful information you want to store about that person, but none of this is required. I'm just going to press submit. And I can see that that user is now now in the system. Yes. With the user login, is it possible to hook it up to ID so that it uses an ID password? Uh, no, that's not yet been done. But a few people have asked in terms of AD or other LDAP-based systems like OD. Um, it's something we tried at the hackathon last year, uh, but the effort was abandoned because of the non-standardization of LDAP. Okay. Um, so there's an LDAP standard. And then AD is Microsoft's version, and OD is Apple's version, and they're all slightly different. Um, so it's something we've thought of, and we'll probably come back to you one day. It would be nice, uh, but not yet. So um, we've got this user here now. They're not really going to show up much in the system because we haven't enrolled them as a student or added them as a member of staff, or put them as a parent in a family of a student. Um, so let's take this person and make them into a colleague, which we actually do under people, staff, manage staff. So uh, because I set the system up, my first account was automatically added as a member of staff. I'm now going to add this extra user as a member of the teaching staff. Okay. If I was to search up here in the Fast Finder where I can see actions, classes, students, and staff, I should see that member of staff appear there. Um, Sandra, that's no longer cached, is it, in version 13? No, because it's using Ajax. So that person should appear straight away. There they are. And because I have the ability to view that person's staff profile here, I can find them 
and see their basic information. So that person is now a member of staff um, and I can start using them in different ways. So if I go back to school admin and I go back to my form groups, I can set that person as the tutor of 7.1. So I'm now starting to really get going with setting up my school. All right, we are supposed to move on um, to modifying Gibbon in a minute. I'm just trying to think if there's any last things that are really vital. Um, once you've added your staff, it's a normal first step to add staff, you can then start adding students and parents. Um, students are not active in the system until they are enrolled under students in student enrollment. So they can have the student role, but they still won't show up as a student up here. You can see our enrollment is zero. So if I was to create an additional user, give them the role student or another student role, and then add them here to enroll them in a particular year and form group, they would then appear here. And with that, you've pretty much got your uh, school up and running. Um, Ross? Yes. A really important note about the class finder, it doesn't pull up users. So if a lot of yeah. people search in there, they think, oh, this person doesn't exist. They probably have a user, they just don't have a student yeah. or staff. Yeah. Um, and that's to constrain access yeah, through but certain ways. Our but, staff yeah, made that yeah mistake absolutely. Um, often people will try and type a parent in there. What you actually need to do is type the student in, and when you access the student profile, um, you, there's a tab called family, and then you get into the, the parents there. If you don't know, so, and this does sometimes happen, you get an email from someone and you don't know. Uh, who they belong to, because you're in a big school, you don't know who their children are, um, under user admin, there's a way to connect up um, students and parents. I wonder, yeah, uh, that's something we'll try and put into the student profile at some point in the future. And you yeah. can search by email address. Yeah, that's right, actually, yeah, you can. Oh yes, yeah, sorry, right here, yep, you can search by parent email. That is new as of version 13, I believe that's why I forgot what it was there. Okay, um, we're going to end this call now. This is the end of session two.